And is there new writing in opera? Yeah, more and more, more and more, more and more commissions, more and more uh, composers wanting to write, more and more writers who want to write libretti. John Morell, a wonderful Canadian writer, mm -hmm. uh, playwright, mm -hmm. has been doing operas, I think, for about five or six years. Mm -hmm. It's a form it, that interests him. And it's the hardest form to write for. Why? Because you have to do everything in a shortened time. Because opera's long. <laughs> you mean plot, character? Everything. If, if in a play you can take three lines to say something in an opera, you probably have to do it in one and allow the music to give you the rest of the information. So one is writing an opera then. How, much, how do you know how much is going to be conveyed through language behind, the, behind the, the song and how much is through the orchestral part? I don't think you can say this much or this much. It's both. can't have an opera without language. Because when I look at American musical theater, uh, there is a dance number. It's, it's, it's an old 19th century form. There's a dance number. There's some singing. There's some choral singing. Then there's a scene. Then there's another song. Then there's a scene. There's some dancing. So it's the, the bits and pieces. In, in London, they're starting to shorten all the scenes. So the little bits of dialogue we had between song 21 and song 22 is disappearing. So it's basically song, star song, chorus song, star song, song, a little bit of plot, song, whatever. And is that not going back to music hall? Is that not going back to the 19th century? I, d I don't know if it's doing that. Um, but what it is doing is saying the public won't have the patience to listen to dialogue. It's saying the public, all the public wants is flash and pizzazz, and I don't think that's true. This is Nick Colacross, who's in, I can't remember the title, it's in a hit show on the West End. And I met on the street, and we went out, you know, John's son, and he's, he plays, he's cornered the market playing the big heavy guy in uh, musical theater and, and musical, you know, over there for Anthony Lloyd Webber and all the rest of it. And he described to me the process where they actually have like a piece of music theater, which there's plot, there's star, there's chorus, and then as it goes along and gets the great reviews, then they try to shrink it. And they shrink out first the or uh, instruments from the orchestra. They start stripping those out. Then they say, well, we've got 16 people in the cast. We don't actually need them. We actually need 12. Let's make those people double. They strip out those. Then they take the narrative bits out because people are only here for the songs. Then we make sure that we always have TV stars to sing the main parts. I don't really want a singer. So Nick says he's standing there listening to someone who really can't sing, not doing it well. And everyone stands up at the end and applauds, having paid 75 pounds. That's why they applaud. <laughs> 75 pounds, I'd applaud too. <laughs> but I'm trying to look at the evolution of storytelling through theater, storytelling through opera, through song, and how we seem to be going, sorry to be going off on this tangent, but because you embrace both worlds. And it seems to me storytelling through theater is stagnated or being marginalized in the last 30 years. Whereas storytelling through music has moved more center stage, whether it's through music videos, whether it's for uh, you know, musical comedies, whether it's through opera. And storytelling through straight narrative, through spoken word, is actually being marginalized. Well, is that because the spoken word isn't very good? I mean. People still go to Shakespeare. I mean, I like to think people still they're go to good Shakespeare. writers. We're being led by America in this, and they're good writers in America. I know it. They're, no, they certainly are. So why aren't those good writers in good writing making it onto the stages of Broadway and opera? Because producers want stuff that's fast and glib. Get to the tune. Get to the tune. Get to the dance number. Get to the tune. There's very little faith in the American public. Very little faith in the audience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why is there no faith in the audience? What am I, a philosopher? <laughs> I can't give you any answers. Oh, you tell me I'm not a is. sociologist. But I don't, it is. It's I part don't of what know. we call dumbing down. Right? Yeah, yeah. You but dumb everything down because and opera I, is more popular. Why do you suppose that is? Because I, my theory is, is because it's dealing with large human beings. It's dealing with archetypes. It's dealing with mythology. You 
cannot make an opera that is kitchen sink. I mean, the moment you sing, you're taking it beyond that. And I think the public, I think the public as a whole, want some kind of mythology, some kind of size to explain our lives, not CSI. But you as a theater guy, you know, you worked through the late 50s. You mm -hmm. watched the emergence of all that kitchen sink writing. Mm -hmm. Let's throw out the Noel cowards. Mm -hmm. Let's actually have theater writing. It's actually about people who live on the street and they mm -hmm. drive trucks and they collect garbage and they go home and they fight mm -hmm. with their wife. Mm -hmm. And we had that for mm -hmm. the 60s and 70s. And then we had the Pinters. We have all these George Walkers. You have all these writers. So you lived through that where mm -hmm. language was powerful, mm -hmm. where those plays using that kind of narrative about all kinds of people yeah. was powerful. And now it's not. Right. What happened? I can't give you an answer. I really don't know. I mean, I do remember, because I was in England when um, uh, The Entertainer was first done, which I saw with Olivier, and it was incredibly powerful for two reasons. One, the language and the text, and B, the performances. They were, it was magnificent, wonderful, as was, as was Look Back in Anger. Um, but I think what happened in, in one way is, is television where the writing, where the writers started to drift toward television because it paid well, and I, and I don't blame them. Uh, and it paid well, but television can't, couldn't sustain the look back in angers. It couldn't sustain it. The, the, the sponsors wouldn't let, allow it to happen, I don't think. I mean, I'm just off the top of my head because I haven't thought about it. But it just seems to me that there has been a total degeneration of theater in terms of language. And I think that's, I mean, one, I mean, when Alice Munro won the Nobel Prize, my wife was in the gym, apparently, I was down in, and apparently she heard it on her headset and screamed with joy. Everybody thought she had a heart attack. <laughs> Right? She came down and told me that Alice Monroe and I screamed with joy. Now this is a writer who writes about people in small towns with small problems and it is so large when you read them. And that's what the theater's missing. They're missing self-examination. They're missing the opportunity to allow an audience to teach us to self-examine our lives. And boy, if you don't have a self-examined life, you're in big trouble. Television certainly isn't doing that. Well, you have to be careful to talk about network television, cable television. Well, They're two different different Yeah, I, but, but also, uh, also, I don't want to disparage television. I love television. I think television's great. What do you like on television? Sports. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, we like sports, and I remember that. And I remember... When I first worked with you as a director, I thought, I've worked with Leon Major. You would talk about the hockey game and the score that went on. And I'm like, wait a minute, this is a theater director. He runs Toronto Arts Productions, and he's interested in the hockey score. That, I found that refreshing early on. Knowing the yeah, game. well, okay. I still go to the games. Okay. <laughs> Apart from sports on television, what other television do you like? There is a series from Europe, uh, a mystery series, in which... Um, there are mysteries created in Germany, Italy, Norway, Sweden, and there's a, a television in, in uh, Virginia that plays these mysteries, and they are truly wonderful. So we're not talking, talking about network North no, American no, television. No, no. We're, talking about we're talking about Foyle's War. Yeah. You know, we're talking about the brilliance of Downton Abbey. Yep. I mean... And these are wonderful shows partially because of the writing. Because the writing is so good. Well, because the culture keeps writers of that caliber yeah. in that form. They keep it Whereas there. Whereas America's leading, they've driven those writers out of that form, and Canada's following America in that, you know, yeah. wonderful writers I, I, like George I, yeah. Walker and, and David yeah. Young are not writing for the theater so much. They have been driven out of the television. Program. Yeah, well, you, you know, I don't want to disparage television because there are a lot of good things on television, um, and and even network television produces some good things once in a while. But I sorry, there's some good things on network television don't, even once in a while. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's the once in the while that killed the station. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
Okay, acknowledged. Touche. <laughs> but but um, I mean, television is just a big maw, and it just eats everything in it, and it just has to keep churning out. There's no time for thought. There's no time. You know, when I when when do you remember the committee? I think it was in the seventies. Um, committee for national, what the hell was it called? Nationalism. There was a whole big committee, 500 people were members of it, who were Canadian nationalists. Um, it was a huge thing. They wanted to ban Time magazine. They wanted to ban, right? Well, I was a part of that. I wanted to block all American television at the border. No television, just Canadian television. Well, that was, of course, impossible. And even now, it's even more impossible. Um, and that's why it's been, it's been homogenized in the, that entertainment industry between Canada and the United States. It's homogenized. It's all one. And when you do get a unique uh, Canadian event or a really unique American event, they can be pretty exciting. So, like the Leafs in Boston last uh, summer, last spring. When they lost that game, they were oh, yeah. ahead four they to lost one. The seventh game. I'm still and cursing they blew them. Blew a lead. I'm cursing them. Four to one. Were you there? No, I watched it on television. Four to one, and they lost. I can't believe it. The Toronto Maple Leafs know how to break your heart. You know, it's, it's a wonderful story about the um, the man who was dying, and he had one request. He wanted. Toronto Maple Leaf hockey players to be his pallbearers because he wanted to be he wanted to be disappointed one last time. <laughs> Nineteen sixty seven, Punch Imlock was the coach. I remember. Remember that? I remember. We're still waiting. If we can work our way through the damage we do to one another, we can find a way to do something that is more supportive, healing, and creative with one another.